Welcome to Dialogue, a true crime conversation. I'm your host, Rebecca Sebastian, and I'm thrilled to welcome my guest, another Rebecca, to the podcast today. Today's guest is the ABC News Chief Business Economics and Technology Correspondent. She is also the host of one of my favorite podcasts, The Dropout. Current season is about Elizabeth Holmes on trial. Of course, I'm speaking about Rebecca Jarvis, who is kind enough and gracious enough to accept my invitation and join me today to discuss some of the key moments happening currently in the Elizabeth Holmes trial. Now, if you recall, this is a federal case, so there are no recording devices, or cameras allowed in the courtroom, which means I can't stream it on court TV and tell everybody about it. So we are relying on journalists like Rebecca Jarvis to report on it so we can know exactly what's happening. And I cannot recommend more highly The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Every Tuesday, there's new episodes. If you want to know what's going on, listen to the podcast, but start here because we just go through some key witness testimony and also some key aspects of why we're still so captivated with the Elizabeth Holmes saga. Now, as you know, we've been in a series here on cult, called Cult Adjacent, and you might be wondering, well, how does Elizabeth Holmes's trial and her story fit into the Cult Adjacent series? Well, I would put forth that we have a bit of a cult of personality situation going on here, much like Steve Jobs, right? Was he a cult leader? No. But did he have a massive, obsessive following? Yes. And I think that's a little bit of what we're seeing with Elizabeth Holmes. She had a larger-than-life personality to the point where people invested billions of dollars in her despite red flags and despite looking into things a little more closely. So it's an interesting perspective to take. I'm really excited for you to hear my chat with Rebecca Jarvis. Please enjoy this episode. And Rebecca, thank you so much for killing the small talk. I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Rebecca Jarvis, host of the Dropout Podcast and the ABC News Chief Business Technology and Economics Correspondent. Welcome, Rebecca. Hi, it's great to be with you, fellow Rebecca. I know, always thrilled to have a Rebecca on the podcast, and thank you for being so receptive to my invitation. Thanks for thinking of us. I'm thrilled you're interested in the Dropout and Elizabeth Holmes. Well, I've been interested in Elizabeth Holmes and her story for, you know, since it first was reported. And you, of course, hosted the first season of The Dropout. And now we're at Elizabeth Holmes on trial. So a lot has happened since that first season. There's been COVID. There's been a pregnancy for Elizabeth and now a baby. And now you're gearing up to report on her actual trial. But can you tell us right now where we're at in terms of the case and the trial? Now, I know it's federal, right? So there's no cameras allowed in the courtroom. That's right. So there's no recording devices in the courtroom. I have been out to California. It's in San Jose where the case is taking place. And they are, they're in it. They're, they have their jury. They're 12 jurors. And in fact, one of the jurors has been dismissed already because she wasn't going to be paid by her employer during the trial. So they, she was replaced by another juror. And we've heard from a number of witnesses and people who have listened to the Dropout podcast. Many of the names will sound familiar. They're people who you got to know over our first season. And now you are hearing again from many of them in our second season as we follow the trial in the courtroom, talking to witnesses after they're done on the stand. We talked to a number of the jurors who were dismissed, people who originally went in and were potentially going to be people hearing this trial and no longer are. And then we've also spoken to some of the people who are there. I mean, it's kind of a circus when you think about what's going on outside. Long line of people waiting to get in every day. And it's not just reporters who are in the room. I've talked to attorneys who are there. They're just interested. Scientists who are interested to see the case. Students. So it really runs the gamut. Well, as somebody who stood in line here in Brooklyn to attend the sentencing of Allison Mack of Nexium, I understand the curiosity curiosity. And I also don't think it's a bad idea for citizens to attend these proceedings to see how our justice system works inside the courtroom is a very different perspective. So I think it's kind of neat when people take an interest. But what do you attribute that to? We are seeing a lot more white collar crimes, if you will, being included in this true crime category. Do you think that is a result of our burgeoning interest? Or do you think there are more of them? Why do you think we're seeing so many more play out so publicly? That's a good question. I think in the case of Elizabeth Holmes, you have this woman 
who is very much an enigma. She was so public with her profile. And part of what interested me in the story initially is that I was pitched Theranos as a technology. I was working on a story with Diane Sawyer at ABC News about how to save money on healthcare costs. And Theranos was pitched to me as a solution to blood testing that would make it cheaper. And when I looked into the story, there wasn't any information from outsiders that could validate for me the claims that Theranos was making. And, and so that was a question mark at the time. And shortly after I started looking into Theranos, Elizabeth Holmes became this star and became so popular. She was on the cover of Forbes and Fortune and one of the most powerful people in the world. She was on all of these lists and being celebrated. She sat across from President Bill Clinton and at the time, Vice President Joe Biden visited her and was getting accolades left and right. So I think that part of what attracted people to this story is the woman and also the stakes. Blood testing is ubiquitous. It's something that we all can imagine ourselves, especially in the midst of the pandemic, that we can all imagine ourselves getting a test and the importance of those tests and the importance of accuracy in those tests. So I think that's a big part of it here. But I also think to your larger question about fraud, that there's in some respects more transparency than ever before because of social media and because of the fact that People are, quote unquote, citizen journalists and taking videos of their own and collecting their own evidence and sharing it widely. But there are also so many more questions in some respects because of that. And what do people really believe? And I think that's part of why you're seeing so many of these stories being reported right now. And as someone who's covered business and technology for almost two decades now in my career and covered Bernie Madoff early on, I'm grateful to see the interest because these stories are happening. And I think it's really important. And in many ways, journalists are the first ones to to tip off the story. It's not necessarily regulators that start looking in first. Right. That's exactly right. So we learned early on in this new season of The Dropout that the defense strategy is going to be that Elizabeth Holmes was experiencing abuse for years with her partner, her business partner and relationship partner, Sunny Balwani. That might explain some of the the fraud, some of the uh, mistakes that were made and that they, it was more him than her. Now, as a defense strategy, does her team have the ability to switch gears if that's not working? Because as exposed in your podcast, we're already hearing evidence that seems like it could disprove some of that. So can they go, hey, this doesn't seem to be working. Let's try something else. Or do they have to stick with that? Well, I've talked to a number of top attorneys and litigators in the country about the strategy and the way that they look at the defense's strategy, both going into this trial and at this point, is that they are pursuing a multi-pronged approach. They are giving themselves ultimate optionality when it comes to how they will pursue this case. And if you think about how the defense opened this case and opened their part, their story, their narrative, it was really a focus on Elizabeth Holmes, this woman who created what was supposed to be this revolutionary technology. And really, if you are someone who's followed the story closely, it was the origin story of Elizabeth Holmes that many people read in 2014 and 2015 when she was getting all of these accolades and her light was shining so bright. So they're really focusing on the woman and the government is focusing very heavily at this stage in the case on the technology. They've brought in a number of people who worked on the technology directly, people like Erica Chung, who was one of uh, the whistleblowers who flagged the issues with the technology to regulators after a few months of her work there, a former lab director, Dr. Adam Rosendorf, and also the finances of the company and where Theranos really was struggling at many times in its history to even do things like pay its employees while on the outside it was projecting this image of being on top of the world and on top of their game. Right. And you you keep referencing Elizabeth Holmes, the woman. And do you think that her gender actually does play into sort of the rise and her fall, that she was so young, her age and her gender did sort of set her apart from a lot of Silicon Valley developers? And she was a unique persona. Do you think that's part of the fascination? I think she was an outlier 
in many ways. If you look at the fact that she raised almost a billion dollars, women receive a tiny portion of venture money. And she was able to go out and get money from some in the venture community, a number of family offices, Rupert Murdoch, the Walton family, uh, the heirs to the Walmart fortune. So she was able to convince so many high profile people. And she also surrounded herself with this incredibly prestigious board, Henry Kissinger, George Schultz, General Mattis, who took the stand surprisingly, and we have an entire episode about what happened there and what he said, because we've really not heard much from uh, her, her board of directors, but certainly this idea that she is an outlier. And that, from talking to people throughout the field of science, the venture community, the fact that she was such an outsider in the early days are very likely what led in part to some of that original publicity because she was one in a million at the time. The other thing is she made these very bold claims and if she had actually delivered on that promise, she could have been the next Steve Jobs. I am so thrilled to announce that Stamps.com is a sponsor of the show because I personally use and rely on Stamps.com. If you have ever received a t-shirt, mug, note, or sticker from yours truly, it has arrived to you via Stamps.com. Since 1998, Stamps.com has been an indispensable tool for nearly 1 million businesses. Stamps.com brings the services of the U.S. Postal Service and UPS right to your computer. Whether you're an office sending invoices, a side hustle Etsy shop, or a full-blown warehouse shipping out orders, Stamps.com will make your life easier. All you need is a computer and a standard printer. No special supplies or equipment. Within minutes, you're up and running, printing official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere you want to send it. And you'll get exclusive discounts on postage and shipping from USPS and UPS. Once your mail is ready, just schedule a pickup or drop it off. No traffic, no lines. Cut the confusion out of shipping. With Stamps.com's new Rate Advisor tool, you can compare shipping rates and timelines easily find the best option. Save time and money with stamps.com. There is no risk. And with my promo code POD, that's P-O-D, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in POD, P-O-D. That's stamps.com, promo code POD, stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. Yeah, there are a number of outlying factors that really do create this composite, this totality of why we're talking about her still. And I I do just suspect for me that if this was a man in his 40s, I don't know that we would be captivated in the same way. And that's like a different, more meta conversation about men and women that we can have another time. But in the last episode, I was struck by General Mattis's testimony and I was surprised and heartwarmed or just his earnest response to being on her board and that he had no experience being on a board and in retrospect admits he probably should have asked more questions, but that he was reading up and preparing to be a good board member. Just something about that was so honest and disarming and surprising. So having him as a witness, and forgive me, what's the number of witnesses that are probably on the list to to potentially give testimony? It is a giant list. Yeah. 200 plus. And there are a lot of, like the General Mattises of the world, there are a lot of high profile names. Wow. And, and you mentioned this episode, there were no expectations in the courtroom that he was going to take the stand. In fact, There was somebody else who was on the stand at the time and court was momentarily disrupted when the government said, wait, we have this very high profile individual. And there there was all this guessing in the courtroom of who it would be. And you mentioned General Mattis. I mean, he talked about on the stand how Elizabeth was the person that he learned everything about Theranos from. He played a protective role. His personal security guard from CENTCOM was provided to her because he was worried that her high profile would make her a target. And you talked about this very earnest moment he shared where he said, I went to the bookstore to buy books about how to be a board member so that I could learn. And I highlighted them 
I know. I know. I I related to that. I know the feeling like saying yes to a job you're not quite ready for. And you're like, say yes, figure it out later. (laughs) Who knew we'd have something in common with him? (laughs) Okay. So the biggest question I'm getting from my listeners is about her voice. It's crazy. People can't let it go, but she probably hasn't testified yet. I'm guessing to this trial. Have you heard her speak audibly to date in this most recent iteration of the trial? She has such a distinctive voice. And again, if you listen to the podcast, you can also probably hear some differentiation. She has not testified at this trial and she has not spoken. She's had many questions, including some from me, lobbed at her as she walks in outside the courthouse into the trial. But so far we haven't heard from her. But when you listen to the podcast, you hear what she sounds like on stage versus what I would say is very different sounding voice in her depositions. And certainly you have a major juxtaposition between an incredibly self-assured woman when she's talking to large audiences and doing interviews for her profiles versus the person who showed up at her SEC deposition in 2017, where more than 600 times she said she didn't know or she right. couldn't recall. That's, that's a very different at least from what we've seen publicly, it's a very different persona. Yeah, she's such a definitive speaker prior to that. Everything she said was so uh, committed and convincing and powerful. So to hear her claim no knowledge of so many things was very striking. So people are curious if her voice still sounds the same. And so I guess we'll have to wait and see. I, I don't think you don't expect she will take the stand, do you? Well, it's possible. Her lawyers have also indicated that, and they did this before the trial began, but they filed documentation, which is pretty rare that you would see documentation like this ahead of a trial that she likely would testify. Now, I've talked to a number of legal experts who say at this point, it still is up in the air. They can say all they want. Lawyers can say all they want going into a trial. They can file every document they want. Again, it's to that point about optionality. They, her attorneys, which are from one of the highest profile firms in the country, Williams and Connolly, nine of them from Williams and Connolly and one additional. So 10 attorneys on her team are the most expensive, essentially best defense you can buy. Do you have any idea? I mean, if her net worth plummeted like it did, I mean, it was in the it was nearing a billion, if not a billion, and it went to zero. How she's affording that? Yeah, I mean, she owned about half of Theranos. So at the time, at the peak time when Theranos was valued at nine billion dollars, she would have been worth four and a half billion dollars, at least on paper. Now, as anybody who understands venture and, and follows that world knows, you have to sell those shares to actually have that money in your pocket. But just being worth that amount allows you to do things like borrow money and 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 go out and do things that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do if you didn't have that money on paper. How did she afford these lawyers? That is a big question because the company went under, it dissolved. So all of that worth that existed on paper no longer exists. I have also talked to a number of legal experts about this. It is possible that her company had a, a policy, some sort of liability policy, which a number of major corporations do that would cover a lawsuit in the event that an individual at the top of the company was ever faced with one. So that's a possibility. But there's other, you know, rumors and speculation about who else in her inner circle would want to pony up and and pay the bill. There's no reporting to that effect. We probably will never know. The only way to know would be for her to answer on the record that question. And to this day, I have asked for interviews of her and Sunny Balwani and a number of individuals in her orbit, and they've turned me down. So if her company did have a policy like that, is that yeah. public or would that never be seen? Publicly? It's not the kind of thing that you would get as public information. Okay. In particular, keep in mind, Theranos was a private company. Yeah. So even though it got gigantic at one point, $9 billion, that's pretty sizable for a private company. They never went public. They never had an IPO. So a lot of these things that if they were public would have been made public aren't accessible. Yeah, it does make you wonder if there is a quiet supporter of hers that exists still that is that is funding this. It's interesting to think about. Another thing I'm really loving about your podcast and how you're presenting the narrative is stories of, I want to say victims, of the malfunctioning device. We hear from a woman whose HCG levels 
fluctuated greatly, which impacted her pregnancy and the decisions around that. And this was a woman who'd struggled. And there's many stories of people who got inaccurate results. So this speaks to the other part of this problem, not just the business mechanics and maybe there being some illegal workings in the way things were structured or going on the back end, but the actual practical, tangible results are people's health being affected. Are we going to hear more of those? And how much do you think that will influence the jury? Well, it's a really important aspect of this story. I mentioned at the beginning of our interview, the stakes here. And I think when you look at a story like this, and I've talked to a lot of legal experts about this, You have, of course, these big time investors, the Rupert Murdoch's and the Walton families and the Betsy DeVos's of the world who already were millionaires or even billionaires when they put money with Elizabeth Holmes. But then you have all of the other people who just needed a reliable test, whether it was for a pregnancy or HIV positivity or or negativity. And as you mentioned, Bethany Gould was a woman who testified recently about her experience with her HCG test. And, and I, I, I just, you know, for purposes of our audience who's listening as a trigger warning, it's a really emotional testimony of a woman who miscarried three times and believed because of an inaccurate Theranos test that she was miscarrying a fourth time when in fact she was not. And you start to see from these individuals what it meant to get misinformed by an inaccurate Theranos test. Now, the defense makes the argument that these are anecdotes, that Theranos administered millions of tests, and you're going to hear from a handful of people who had misinformation. What the defense did not say in its opening statement when it talked about those tests and and the millions that were administered was that Theranos also had to wipe out two years worth of tests because they were inaccurate. So we know that that is part of Theranos' story as well. And we will be hearing from more of these doctors and patients at trial who were misinformed. Good. Okay. Well, we look forward to new episodes as the trial continues and hearing updates. And we appreciate your insight and you being here. Before you go, I do ask, and this is very not connected to the conversation. (laughs) I do ask all my guests, if it was your last meal tonight, what would you eat? So I know you asked this question and it's a real (laughs) struggle for me because Meals are really serious. I mean, I'm the person at the restaurant who changes my order after I've placed it, and I get order envy all the time. And look, I could say I'd have a burrito because I love burritos, or I'd have sushi because I love sushi, but the bottom line for me is that I would love a perfect croissant. Like oh pastries, God. a perfect pastry. I I studied on scholarship in Paris in college. And so I have this very, very warm feeling in my heart for a delicious and perfect croissant. So yeah, the perfect croissant is what I'm going with here. Everybody keep listening for new episodes on Tuesdays of the Dropout Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Rebecca, thank you so much for being on Dialogue and Killing the Small Talk. It was my pleasure. Thanks, Rebecca. Great work. Thank you. Dialogue is a Yellow Tape Media production, audio engineered by Jason Usry, and produced, hosted, and edited by me, Rebecca Sebastian. If you love the podcast, please consider becoming a diehard by signing up at patreon.com slash dialogue. Other ways to support the show? Follow along on social media. We are at Dialogue Pod across platforms, and you can now watch most episodes on YouTube by subscribing to my channel, Rebecca Sebastian. For more information or to drop me a note, visit RebeccaSebastian.com. Until next time, thank you for listening and killing the small talk.